Karen. Yes. We've had hundreds of conversations about hundreds of different topics while doing the show. We have. Sadly, just because someone's consciousness might be expanding, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean you can safely integrate your new awareness into your daily lived experience, right? Right. I mean, we, um, you may not even know what I was talking about just that, right? <laughs> Nope. Right. But see, we've heard a lot about how it can be difficult and challenging to handle when everything you right. thought you knew about yourself and your reality gets yeah. turned upside down. Well, then how do you do it and hold on a successful physical life that others might not understand or even yeah. accept some of the changes that you're undergoing? That's tricky. It is tricky. Well, if you're listening to this, then there's a good chance that this is a reality that you find yourself struggling with. And that this is the episode you may have been waiting for all along. Because today, we're talking with an expert in helping people transition from the 3D to 5D and way beyond. Need help getting a grip? Then stay tuned because by the end of this show, you're going to know just what you need to do to handle and integrate your spiritual transformation into your career or into your current life. The Skeptic Revisitions starts now. My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something. Anything. That will prove that there's something beyond this physical. Three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thought-provoking episode of the Skeptic Metaphysicians podcast. I'm Will. And I'm Karen. And today we have the honor of hosting a distinguished guest, a luminary at the intersection of skepticism and metaphysical exploration. She's a veteran in the realm of spiritual transformations and integration, having served as the past president of the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. Say that five times fast. Now, her extensive background includes over a decade of dedicated work supporting and guiding individuals who have undergone profound spiritual experiences, a journey that commenced in her own childhood and has traversed with her into her adult life. With a wealth of experience spanning decades, our guest expertise is deeply rooted in not just a theoretical, but the lived reality of spiritual encounters, enriching her perspective with firsthand knowledge and empathetic understanding. I'm not going to say anything else because I don't know if I'm making any sense at all. <laughs> I'm just going to welcome the show, Elizabeth Sabbath. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Will and Karen. I'm grateful to be here. Mm, uh, we are thrilled to have you. Mm -hmm. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart for lots of different reasons. But let's start at the very beginning. When we are talking about spiritual transformative experiences, that covers a wide gamut. So what can we talk about in that sense? Well, I like to call them, so as you said, there's a wide variety of experiences, but typically spiritually transformative experiences or STEs for short are a, a type of nonlinear, non-ordinary experience that takes you out of your enculturated worldview and gives you an opportunity to experience life differently. And so uh, there's a list of about 126 different types. The Brown and researchers Brown and White identified approximately 126 types of experiences in their research. Good God. And, wow. Yeah. Now, is, yeah. is, is that something like when I was in college, um, so friends of mine got STEs all the time and had to go get a pill to get it taken yeah. away. <laughs> Little <something>? oh, <laughs> it has begun. <laughs> no, not the same thing. <laughs> Some people take pills for this, but yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So 126. I mean, wow. Are we talking about like a tap on the shoulder? Are we talking about your life falling apart? I mean, I, I assume yes, they all of the above, yes. I would think. Hmm. All of, yeah, potentially all of the above. There's so many different types. Anything from a mystical experience where you experience after death communication, maybe your dead grandmother sits on your bed in the middle of the night and scares you, uh -huh. uh, wants to yes, talk to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, an out of body experience, a near death experience, a crisis of psychic opening which could be clairaudience, clairsentience, 
clear tangency. I can never say that word Gesundheit. where you pick up an item and yeah. you just know something about the person that had mm -hmm. that owned that object. Uh, but any exceptional, there could be called exceptional human experiences, numinous experiences, luminous experiences, mm. non-ordinary, non-linear states of consciousness experiences. Okay. It could be a unitive state of consciousness experience where you're just walking down the street, minding your own business, and bam, all of a sudden, you experience one. oneness with yeah. everything around you. That's yeah. that's what happened, Karen. That's what that's. I know. Uh, it's, I know. This, this, so yes, yes. This, I'm so glad that you brought this up because I've got I've had flashes of that all of a sudden, like oh my god, and it it's been glorious, fantastic. Like I have not wanted to come out of it, but inevitably I go to sleep. Yeah. The next morning I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a blackout after you're drinking all night long, right? It's different, yeah. and I'm sure a lot of people have run into those that are living in those experiences on a prolonged basis, and they're thinking, what is wrong with this guy? Right. So this is kind of what we're talking about now. How does... Well, they can they can happen uh, spontaneously in a very split second or they can be prolonged. They can last minutes or hours or days or weeks or months. Are, are these things that you can kind of help to happen? Like if you want to have those experiences, there's something you can do. Are there some steps to take? No, she said there was a pill for it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was after when it happens unexpectedly. Oh, 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 oh. Got it. Well, these experiences happen in all types of ways. They can happen because of illness. Mm -hmm. Women can have them during childbirth. Childbirth can bring these on. An accident. They can come in dreams. They can come through meditation practices, yoga practices. They can come through for absolutely no reason, apparently no reason at all. Trauma. Uh, so then uh, sometimes things like that can be wonderful. And it has been wonderful for a lot of folks, but there are some people, and we've talked to a few of them, that they thought they were going crazy or their lives Absolutely. were ending. And so you actually are an expert at helping people get a grip, for lack of a better word, right? Mm -hmm. So how can someone integrate this sudden awareness expansion into their daily life? It depends on where they're at when they come looking for help. Sometimes people go to mental health professionals who are not trained in identifying or differential diagnosis between psychosis and spiritual emergence and emergency, which there are DSM codes for spiritual and religious problems. And there is research literature around this, but it's not a requirement for mental health professionals to get licensed. So they don't get trained in it as of yet. Uh, oh. There's one university, Rutgers University, which is in the process of integrating this information into their educational process. Wait, 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 wait. Are you saying, you saying that this is a clinically accepted no. experience? Yeah, no. So okay. in, some, in some clinical settings with people who've been trained by it, who want to be trained, and that's what ASSIST did, the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. So we used to host academic conferences to train mental health professionals and other helping professionals and to get training on differential diagnosis. They're no longer doing those trainings, but we're looking for other places to, I'm looking for other places to host that training so I can organize more academic conferences because it's not happening at the collegiate level. Mm -hmm. They're not getting trained. But, but you said that there were codes for that. There's a diagnostic code in the DSM, yes. Wow. So that's 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 kind of eye-opening uh, when you, I mean, to have a code, a diagnosis code, you have to accept that there is something to code for. Yeah. And right now it's, uh, th the problem is Yale University has just finished, a, they've done two studies on hearing voices and how why is it, how is it possible that some people hear voices and they can manage it fine mm -hmm. and they go on their daily life like, oh yeah, heard from my grandmother. Or, oh yeah, an angel told me this or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or whoever. Okay, I'm going to go do that now. And they go on and they do it and they're fine. And why do other people hear voices that cause problems that they can't handle and they can't make it stop? When Harvard is looking at this, are they thinking- I think it's Yale. Or, I'm sorry, Yale. Yale. I'm sorry. When Yale. Yale's looking mm -hmm. at this, are they looking in the direction of like these are they're communicating with other people or are they just 
considering all of these a form of psychosis. That, these that was are one of my little problems with the first research is because it's about hallucinations, oh. hearing voices. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to the researchers about that um, as an advisory person, uh, you know, on their advisory committee, I was like, my people are not going to be happy participating in this study. They were looking for research participants because uh -huh. you're using the term hallucination. And they don't believe that they're hallucinating. And they mm -hmm. said, yeah, we understand that. And we have to do the basic research first so that and using the academic language that the current academic standard is going to accept. And when I've read the first uh, when I read the first uh, research article, I still had a bit of a problem with it <laughs> as somebody who has heard voices myself. And, and at the same time, it's foundational and it's really important to help people stay safe because as we know there are people who hear voices and then go out and kill people mm -hmm. right yeah or they're tormented by these voices and they can't make them stop and they're not just talking to somebody a, a loved one or relative on the other side that they can hear in a form of after-death communication and it's comforting and nurturing so they do have to make sure that they are the medical community and the mental health community is causing no harm. They are responsible if they put somebody on the street who could potentially cause harm. Mm -hmm. So they have to start with this baseline to know the difference. And, and the premise of the research is what can we learn from people who hear voices and are fine with it and who can control it voluntarily? that we can use to support people who cannot. And so the foundation of the research, I thought, was very respectful. And I think it will go a long way to further research as to, is it this kind of voice or is it that kind of voice? And it's not looking at where is this voice coming from, or they're yeah. not attempting to validate where the voice is coming from in that particular research. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway mainstreaming this type of understanding about spiritually transformative experiences is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an organization called the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, which is looking, actively looking for funding and fundraising for research and for emergent phenomenon and to understand it and to build towards the body of research that would contribute to differential diagnosis and proper care and integration for people who've had these experiences and are asking that question, am I crazy? Am I okay? Is this, what am I supposed to do with that? Mm -hmm. And what was this organization again? The EPRC, the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium. Uh, it's the EPRC.org. Perfect. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. This is an organization of global researchers that are coming together to share their work and to make connections and to take a look at what's currently happening in the research world concerning emergent phenomenology. It's multidisciplinary. There are uh, researchers and practitioners and even people like myself that show up to the meetings that are from all different disciplines that are contributing to some body of knowledge. There are very limited places where somebody who's asking these questions can go. Assist mm -hmm. has a online forum that's very well moderated. And so they could go to assist.org and click on the tab to be led into the, you know, the forum. And that is a peer led forum, but they're very well trained peers that are moderating that. So right now, the majority of the help out there is peer led in groups that you can find an abundance of on Facebook. Well, then let's get back to the experiences themselves. I'm sure there are some that are much more difficult to integrate than others. Do you have a an idea of what someone should be looking out for? It could be any experience that creates an ontological shock. If I have a specific worldview that everything I see is real and solid, and all of a sudden I have an experience of somebody walking through the room coming to see me, right? Like it, somebody on the other side. Or if I think that's demonic, if I, my religious upbringing has taught me that that contact is bad and here it is with me, that could be very difficult. For oh, others, yeah. it wouldn't be very difficult at all. Right, right. Um, dark spiritual experiences are the most uh, difficult for people to integrate. And then the ones that are the farthest away from their current belief system, worldview or God view, 
mm. are the most difficult to integrate because okay. not all experiences are all sunlight and butterflies and unified at the heart center. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes, they are. <laughs> I'm going to keep telling myself that until it happens. <laughs> we create our own reality, damn it. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. That's what I thought too until I went to hell. Oh, wow. Okay. So did you have an NDE or is it just like you just decided to take a trip? Uh, no. One of my funky gifts is to support people in transitioning from this life to the next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I get called out of my body to do that. It's almost like there's a signal and my soul leaves the body. So weird alert, really wow, crazy, woo woo alert. So people may <laughs> not believe this. So <clears throat> just saying. It's not what I really talk about, but you saying that was like, yep, I know. Mm -hmm. I know that one. Okay. So I'm in the hospital. I'm in my living room and then I can't, all of a sudden I'm just completely inundated with fatigue. I can't even sit up. I had to lay down and had no presence of tiredness prior to that. And then the next thing I know, I'm out of my body. I'm being pulled out of my body and I'm in a hospital room up in the corner of the room. And somebody is dying. Uh, a man was dying in an ICU by himself. Mm. And he was very angry and bitter. And he was saying to himself, man, nobody's ever given me a break. Life has sucked. Now I'm dying here by myself and I have to go to hell. And this is you know, such an unfair life. I don't even know why God made me. You know, what was the purpose of my life? And so the next thing I know, I'm with him as where I called it the upper reaches of hell, which I didn't even believe in. Personally, I'm a student of A Course in Miracles and a student of a different kind of Jesus than what I was taught as a child. And, and so this, first of all, was quite terrifying. I mean, I have worked with people on the other side and assisted them in transitioning from the earth plane before. This was quite different. So I'm standing at this place, which looked pretty hell-like, <laughs> that I didn't even believe in. Oh, you could almost say it was hellish. <laughs> yeah, it was hellish. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't move. I was terrified. I didn't even want to turn my head. I just looked at my periphery. Okay. So and, it was, was it the flames and Inferno and Pitchfork kind of thing, kind of hell? It was, it was um, I actually had an experience of eternal condemnation an eternal hopelessness. And, you know, it's not like the movies where they were like, please, it wasn't yeah. that level. It was the level where they couldn't even lift their arms. They couldn't even lift their arms to say, help me. Interesting. They didn't even have the belief in them that they could ask for help. They were no longer even seeking help because they didn't believe it was available. I'm freaking out. All I can see is an uncountable number of souls standing before me in this experience of absolutely eternal hopelessness. It was a bit, it was so bad. You know how people, mm -hmm. I've listened to countless NDE experiences where people talk about how good it is and they can't explain it. This was the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I started, and I'm, screaming at them like, no, 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 y'all have been lied to. This isn't real. This is an illusion. You know, you need to wake up. You don't have to be here. Like you've been lied to. And I could self being pulled down like quicksand and I couldn't get out. And so I was like, oh, gee, God, I, I, I know you don't want me here, but I can't get out by myself. I need your help. And like that, back up out of it and back into my body in the living room and function for three days. It took three days for me to get my body to stop shaking and to try and figure out what happened. And oh. I went to my favorite coffee shop for three days all day from open to close, reading my Course in Miracles book, trying to figure out what the heck happened. Right. Because nothing spells relief like caffeination. <laughs> you're funny that's right that's right and and the local bookstore run by your local buddhist right right, <laughs> right. Coffee, sh coffee shop uh, run coffee by shop, your local yeah. buddhist yeah 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 so you know 
that took three days and to integrate, but only three days because the coffee shop owner came by and it was a long story I won't get into, but she said, oh, you went to hell. How sweet. You know, when the, what the Buddha says about hell, if you find yourself in hell, you're there to mine jewels. And I, and I, was, I looked at her like she was crazy, but it gave me that new perspective to look at. You know, instead of being mm -hmm. stuck in, why did this happen to me? Am I crazy? Oh, here's a different perspective. I can take this in and look at it differently. And what did I, what could I have learned from that? And I did, I learned a lot, but it was very difficult. So for would other people, would it have taken three days or would it have taken longer? No one knows the answer to that question. It's based on your capacity. The, the integration process is based on your capacity to take in new information and give yourself permission to explore it. It's when we reject this new information that it takes longer to integrate. Was this your first kind of opportunity or I guess experience with helping transition someone? No. Okay. Because I was just thinking, you know, Will was saying we create our own reality and, and you know, you can believe in hell or not believe in hell. And I'm, I was just thinking, what if this man's hell was so strong that he kind of sucked you into his reality? Would that be a possibility? Uh, absolutely. I mean, when you work with people on the other side, you have to go into their reality to rescue them out of it. Mm, right. So then if that's the case, then maybe there doesn't have to be a hell. Well, I, I, kind, of, I kind of see it like uh, what dreams may come, right? The movie where we all create yeah. our own afterlife. So mm -hmm. this person obviously believed in hell and this was the hell he believed in or he thought he was going to go to. Because Elizabeth, you said... Um, right as you were mentioning him, that he was saying, I don't know why God even made me. Now I've got to go to hell, that kind of thing. So he already had that in mind, in his mind. Mm -hmm. It was so his as belief. He was passing over. Right. So as passing over, you experienced his version of the afterlife. So that's just another example of how important it is to solidify what your beliefs are <laughs> and, and, and to not take it flippantly, but think positive thoughts, right? Because who wants to go to hell, for God's sakes? Yeah, nobody. And do you know Dr. Nathan Castle? He is a Catholic priest who also helps people transition, lost souls transition. And I was visiting with him, and we both agree that the most important thing anybody in a helping profession can do, or anybody who loves anybody, is to help them recognize how beautiful they are and how lovable they are and how worthy they are. And that any mistakes that we make are mistakes from a lack of understanding or experience and mm -hmm. not worth being condemned for. There is nothing more important, I think, personally, than helping people um, receive as much love as possible before they leave this earth, because that will ensure uh, a safe transition from this life to the next. So then... I know that we had talked earlier about you go through these experiences and you already having a hard time handling it, but then you throw in the fact that we have to, we have to live, we have to work, we have to raise a family, we have to keep going with our lives. And everybody knows it's getting better. But when someone said to you sometimes in the past, hey, I'm hearing voices, you immediately get put in a straitjacket. So how does someone who's having these experiences how do you manage to integrate that into your daily life without seeming like you're a loon? Well, the first thing is to find someone who understands you, specifically with hearing voices. There's uh, an organization called the Hearing Voices Network who has a very strong support system of people who do hear voices. And it's very important when you share your experiences that you know who to share them with. If you already know mm. that your experience is going to maybe freak someone out, freak some, <laughs> make them concerned that you're talking to the devil or going to hell, you might want to talk to somebody else first that has some experience with them. And uh, it depends. So in a light-filled spiritual experience, with a light-filled spiritual experience, so many times people are filled so full of love and light, they want to share it with everybody and they're so enthusiastic about it that they're sharing it with people who can't relate. And then you experience that letdown or that disappointment or you feel ostracized. 
But what I suggest to people is that first they have compassion for the people who have not had the experience Mm -hmm. instead of expecting to go to a well full of water and get a drink. But if that person hasn't had your experience, then they can't meet you there. And if it's outside of their worldview, you can expect resistance. So first to find people who can understand that you've had some form of nonlinear, non-ordinary experience. They're go by so many different names. Some people don't even like the word spiritual anymore, right? So they could be a transcendent experience or a non-ordinary experience. And there are therapists now that are trained or who work with non-ordinary states and coaches and spiritual guidance directors. So looking Mm -hmm. for a spiritual guidance director in your specific faith tradition to help you work things out could be a safer person to talk to than perhaps a therapist to begin with that Mm -hmm. hasn't been trained. Yeah, because they might try to help fix you so you're not hearing the voices, but what if they're they're important voices that you need to hear? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And working with these, you know, is the voice coming from you, from your Mm -hmm. psyche and your subconscious or your higher self? Is it coming from the light or is it coming with a flavor of darkness towards it. And that even flavor Mm. of darkness could be within yourself as well. Teasing out, is it light? Is it dark? Is it heavy? Is it light? What is the attention? And it's important to talk about these kinds of things with the right folks, because a lot of times, if you do have these experiences and you start opening up on them and get negative feedback, that then tends to get you to close up even more. Mm -hmm. For example, we all know that evolving spiritually transcend this reality is, is what we're all trying to achieve in one way or another. Everyone in this space in in a new age or new thought space or whatever we're talking about here, everything we've heard about is that this is a positive step forward. This is the next evolution of mankind is into this, in this direction. So if we are doing that and all of a sudden we take a little baby step into this world and we get slapped back, that might shut down any future experiences that would then prevent you from moving where you need to go, right? So it's really important to to really do this discerningly so that uh, that you don't close yourself off because it, 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 like we talked many times, you're not going crazy. This is perfectly natural and normal stuff. It's just not, not, not everybody is at the level at which you are. That's and right. there's no need to convince anyone of anything because you're not going to be able to anyway. That's right. You can't convince somebody who hasn't had the experience. And it is natural and normal for an evolving consciousness to start losing touch with Newtonian paradigm physics and to be experiencing something beyond the ordinary, what we would call the ordinary in the 3D. And so one of the questions people ask is, why is this happening? why me? And if it wasn't childbirth or a trauma or a near-death experience, and even those things, I say, because your soul is ripe. Your soul is ready to be expanded beyond your enculturated identity. Mm. And the benefit, even though it's very challenging and can be scary, and you can lose relationships, and people do lose many relationships because of it. It's a natural, normal part of your consciousness expanding And all sorts of things are going to happen. Some very challenging things where you may have karma arise, different, which is just more learning. And in the purification process of having our enculturated identity purified, that means we're also purifying our concepts about unworthiness and sin and disempowerment. Right. And those things are very challenging to to deal with. There's so many different directions that we can go but i definitely it's one of the things that when doing research on you before we came on the show one of the things that caught my attention was your thoughts on plant medicine mm. because there's there's a there's a big question mark some people believe that plant medicine is, is actually helps with expanding your consciousness and taking you the necessary evolutionary step and things like that but then there's other factions they talk about plant medicine being a crutch, that maybe mm. it's not exactly what people are saying that it is. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So just like anything else, psychedelics can become a crutch. Meditation become, all spiritual practice can become a crutch. We call that spiritual bypassing. Okay. 
That mm-hmm. means when <laughs> we are ignoring the, the attending to the, the normal needs of human life or spiritualizing something to not look at it, to not deal with it. I just want to say that. So anything can become a crutch. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. There's a big debate. Should you engage in psychedelics to expand your consciousness and to advance spiritually? Will it help you? If it doesn't break your consciousness first, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, if you have good integration support and you have a really good trip sitter uh, or someone who's been trained in shamanism that knows what they're doing and knows how to hold space for it to not allow anything else in the space to attach to you and knows if there's something rising up within you, how to allow that space and support it while it's arising and proper post session, you know, post integration sessions, then it's the risk of of being so broken that you can't be put back together again. It's greatly reduced. Psychedelics are here. They're back. And I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see it coming, you know, instead of being a something that the old, I, I'm saying stoners in quotation marks, very lovingly <laughs> and respectfully, okay? Um, that it's being taken out of the, the basement or the backyard or whatever and being brought into a cultural space where we can look at the benefit of it and where the experience itself can be supported. And that's the wonderful benefit and the healing, the amazing healing of the mind and the and the spirit that happens with proper ceremony is mm. absolutely incredible. The suffering that can be eradicated. Yeah. It's amazing. Not to throw stones at it at all. Yeah. I mean, I, there, there are lots of research that, that are being done now that are finding, uh, it's actually, they're, they're continuing now the research after a big gap. That's um, right. Now they're, they're finding that a single session of MDMA, for example, or psilocybin will help cure PTSD. It's not even to ease the symptoms, but rather they're finding that a single, single session could have a completely life-changing effect on someone who's suffering. So that's, that's remarkable. Mm-hmm. The question is, you hear it back in the day, right? If you, you did six drops of acid or more, you're going yes. you go insane, right? Yes. So I assume that that kind of thought, problem, like you said, anything in, in mo- everything in moderation, every, anything that's abused is going to become a problem. Mm-hmm. So um, it's important to do it with a proper facilitator, as you say. But you do believe then that it there is a place for these psychedelics in a spiritual pursuit. Is that right? Yes. And... So I'm kind of old school in the fact that I think that you have to, what are you being devoted to? There has to be devotion, but what are you, if, are you devoted to truth, beauty, love, creator? Are you devoted to these in a way that you're attempting to do your best to live from these principles, the devotion to these principles first, that has to be there. But the reality is, is for some people, they can't get there without having a strong pattern interrupt. And what Mm. the psychedelics do is it interrupts a pattern. So somebody can do nothing but prayer, development of their personality. It has to be, spiritual development needs to be psychological and have the spiritual uh, devotion component in order to be balanced. Because if you skip the psychological development and go just total into spiritual, then you're going to have to, at some point, come back and pick up the psychological development that you've missed out on. And if you're all intellect and all psychological development with no spirit, at some point, you'll get confronted with that if it's your lifetime for that. Okay. Mm. So Mm. part of the problem is, is that People are doing psychedelics, they're doing meditation, they're doing all sorts of devotional practices without having attended to their trauma Mm -hmm. or their hatred or their resentment or their guilt or their shame. And then they come to these practices and they're so blown open and, and can see that and afterwards, because whether it's through a spiritually transformative experience that happens spontaneously or an intentional psychedelic experience is you start becoming a different person. And that different person, if you have a lot of that stuff, 
you know, a lot of hidden guilt and shame. That stuff mm-hmm. starts to arise now that your consciousness has expanded a little bit. And you're recognizing like, oh, my God, who was I before? Mm. Oh, my God, I can't believe I did that. I was a horrible person. Now wow. I have to be with that. And that's been the hardest thing I've had to work with with people in integrating is they become awake to their own behavior that they are now ashamed of and feel mm-hmm. guilty for. And they don't know how to forgive themselves. It becomes less of forgiving others and more of a challenge to forgive themselves. Elizabeth, <laughs> you and I are going to have a conversation <laughs> after this. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting, though, because a lot of people turn to these practices because they have all of these issues and the trauma is, you know, in their childhood or whatever. And they're thinking this can help them. But what you're saying is they actually need to deal with that first before coming into these practices. It's best. You'll yeah. have a less okay. challenging post-integration. If you deal with this first, but we see, we're just not talking about this as a society. Mm -hmm. We're just, you know, uh, mental health. I'm 58. Mental health was not a social and cultural topic. We didn't talk about our therapist at the dinner table. Like, you know, oh, I love my therapist. No, we didn't do that. (laughs) I do, by the way. Uh, Hi, Dr. Jones. (laughs) (laughs) I love her too. Hi, Dr. Jones. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And so. This is the problem with people who go on like long Vipassana retreats, you know, 10 Mm -hmm. day silent meditation retreats is they sometimes go into psychosis during or after because I talk about the process of strengthening the container of your consciousness, that the Mm -hmm. most important thing you can do before engaging in any spiritual practice is to strengthen the container of your consciousness. So what that means to me is that You have a practice of paying attention to what's arising in your emotions and in your thoughts and determining how is this thought or this emotion, you know, what information is being presented to me? Mm -hmm. What is this information informing me of that I need to attend to right now, as opposed to this emotion means something bad, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Attending to our shadows. And we we should make a a definitive distinction about what we're talking about. There are a faction of those that use this type of thing for an escape Mm -hmm. um, or recreation, Mm -hmm. right? You drop a tab of acid because you want to, you don't want, you don't want to think about the world and you, right? You're, you're having fun or you're, you're doing mushrooms and let's go howl at the moon, that kind of thing. We're talking about very specific ritualistic reasons for and intentions when you are undergoing these journeys for Mm -hmm. lack of a better Mm -hmm. word it's important to have that we're not condoning a recreational use of mushrooms for example or or anything like that this is more about once you're ready to take that next step if you're stuck this might be able to help you but do it in the right way it might be if you are going to a trip sitter who has been trained in Mm -hmm how to hold safe space and safe ceremony and how to support you in lifting out what is arising out of you should you need support if the medicine isn't doing it itself. Right. So Johnny down the block who has a bag of shrooms in his pocket does not a good trip sitter make. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, no. I've I've worked with uh, young people who've done that and whose whole life was blown apart and could no longer fit into their society. Because, and I won't share their stories here because they don't have permission, who no longer fit in. They could no longer be, they couldn't go hang out with the guys and drink beer anymore. They couldn't, you know, just try to have sex with every girl that would get in bed with them. They just couldn't do those things anymore. And so what I want to say about this is, is that if anybody's listening to this, it's interested in psychedelics and you have access to the medicine because it is sacred medicine. Okay. But remember that these plants came, uh, the use of these plants, we came to know about the use of these plants through medicine men and women of tribal cultures all over the world. And they are medicine to be respected and to be used appropriately. In sacred tradition, there's a diet that you have to do for six to 10 days. There's a purification process that you have to put the body through or it could kill you. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then you must Uh, meditate every day. Like with ayahuasca, you must meditate every single day for 10 days before you drink the medicine with the shaman. 
when you meditate with the plant spirit, you're connecting to the essence of the benefit of that medicine. And you take your challenge or your trauma or your physical ailment or your relationship problem, whatever that is, you take that to that plant spirit and you say, please, here is my dilemma. Please help me. And you're, it's a supplication to the divine nature of that medicine. Gosh, mm -hmm. I, and I, there's so much that we could dive into and talk about, but yes. I definitely wanted to talk about the fact that on your website, you give classes, you help folks. Uh, and it's not just you, but you have a few facilitators that would, would help people integrate these kinds of things into their life. If someone wanted to get better at it, you would recommend go to your website and reach out to you there? To get better at, yes. At integrating, yeah. You know. Yeah, it, integrating the experience, yes. I'm actually graduating a new group of spiritual integration coaches in December, actually. We'll have uh, five more coaches on the roster. So, yes, I do have people that can support people in integration, whether it's psychedelics or, or any other experience. That's great. So then whether you are uh, looking for help or you want to help others, that might be a good resource for you. Absolutely. All right. Wow. Elizabeth, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing your expertise with us, uh, sharing space with us. And we're going to add direct links to your website and social media on our show notes. So all you need to do is go to skepticmetaphysician.com. Go to her episode page. You'll see all those links laid in there directly for you. So it makes it super easy to get connected with Elizabeth. Once again, thank you so much for coming on. It's been wonderful. It has been. Thank you so much for having me. And a huge thank you to you. We know that there are tons of options out there. And having you decide to come along on our journey of discovery with us is an absolute honor for us. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. If you did and you feel called to give back, we invite you to visit our website at skepticmetaphysician.com where you can donate to the show or subscribe as a member through our Buy Me a Coffee campaign. Your support will go a long way towards allowing Karen and I to bring you these wonderful conversations and teachings in more and more robust ways. Well, that's all for now. We will see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care. Mm -hmm.